Okay, hello everybody. Hello. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? It's a chatty, enthusiastic group. I'm so excited. I want to say welcome. My name is Julie Noblet. I'm the uh, Energy and Climate Program Director at Actera. And I want to welcome you tonight to the final, last but not least, lecture in our Spring 2019 Actera Lecture Series. Uh, if Actera is new to you, uh, I just want to say a couple of words about it. We're an environmental nonprofit. Uh, and since 1970, we've been bringing people together to create uh, local solutions for a healthy planet. We've done a lot of things in those 50 years, but today we really have a laser focus on climate change and making it faster, easier, cheaper for people to take action on uh, climate mitigating the main sources of carb carbon emissions. We have a Go EV program to get people out of their gas powered cars and into EVs, a green at home program that encourages people to reduce their energy waste and electrify, uh, a business environmental awards program that recognizes businesses big and small that go above and beyond to uh, uh, promote energy, uh, sorry, sustainability practices in, in what they do and an environmental justice program called Climate Resilient Communities, uh, where we make sure that the benefits of clean energy uh, access are available to everyone, uh, regardless of income. So before I introduce our speakers tonight, and we can go to the next uh, PowerPoint, um, I have some thank yous in order. So our lecture series underwriters are Mary and Clinton Gilliland and Armand and Elian Nukermans. Uh, and without them, without their support, we couldn't do this. So we thank them very much. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, they're amazing. Uh, we have other sponsors, uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and the Foster Art and Wilderness Foundation, uh, who have generously provided this space and all the really nice uh, snacks and everything. We really thank them. Uh, and then, of course, our Actera staff and volunteers. If you're an Actera staff member, would you please raise your hand really high and let people see who you are? <laughs> yes. Um, and especially, especially Gwen Casriel, who's really um, taken the lead in coordinating our whole lecture series, who's there by the uh, projector. Uh, finally, I want to thank the MidPen Media Center, who's, um, they are taping tonight's lecture, as they do many of our lectures. And so you can find a recording of this on YouTube, on the uh, Actera website, and potentially also in local cable channels. So without any further ado, I would really like to uh, welcome our speakers, Annie Nodoff and uh, Max uh, Baumhefner. Uh, Annie is Senior Western Advocacy Director for the Natural Resources Defense Council, or the NRDC. Uh, I am in love with the NRDC. How many of you, uh, we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. They are fighting uh, for our rights to clean air, clean water, and healthy um, communities. So I'm um, really happy to have them here. Uh, Annie in particular has led NRDC's efforts to get many of California's nationally significant environmental laws enacted. Um, you know, a short list, and I'm sure there's more, the Marine Life Protection Act, the Pavley Clean Car Bill, Global Warming Solutions Act, Climate and Land Use, Water Policy Reforms, Clean Energy and Pollution Reduction Act, the 2030 Greenhouse Gas Reduction Targets and Equity, uh, and extending California's price on carbon to 2030 and strengthening local air quality controls. And I'm sure there's much more, so I'm really thrilled that Annie is here. Um, Max is senior attorney with the Climate and Clean Energy Program at NRDC, and he's been working to make our nation's cars, trucks, and buses zero emission vehicles, and focusing on electrifying the transportation sector. So let me stop talking and welcome them uh, to, the, to the chairs for a nice conversation. They'll be talking about uh, California's climate leadership and how it might be extended to other states. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, um, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, I'm a local girl. I grew up uh, just down the street and graduated from Menlo Atherton High School. My uh, father's lived down here for 63 years, so it's very uh, much a part of my heart. And I think that um, really a lot of what propelled me to go into environmental work in the first place was the beauty here on the peninsula and the coast. So I always think of this as really kind of a very soulful place for me. Um, I have been with NRDC now for uh, <coughs> uh, 40 years, nearly. And um, during that time, I've been very fortunate to work uh, on a full range of issues with our uh, talented staff of experts. Uh, I got to know Sacramento because um, in the early days I worked on uh, local coastal planning. I worked on the San Mateo County Coastal Plan. Um, and uh, over the years, whenever any developers didn't like something that the Coastal Commission was doing, they would run to Sacramento and try and undo the Coastal Act. So I would run to Sacramento and try and defend the law. And uh, that's how I learned to see how Sacramento works and get to know all the players. And so when um, NRDC decided to set up a California-based program in 1999, it made sense for me to uh, head that up. And I will say that uh, in beginning in 1999 with the election of Gray Davis, when the, uh, both the California Assembly and Senate were led by environmental champs and the governor was uh, an environmental leader too, I mean, the first 10 years of the 2000s, we really were able to do things that we had been stalled, had been stalled for a long time after that. Um, and just some of, Julie mentioned some of the things that um, California has been able to do. Uh, and I wanted to kind of emphasize and we'll talk a little bit about how, what California does matters beyond our borders so much. Uh, you know, we have set up the first network of marine protected areas al along the coast, and that's inspired other states to do that. Even the Bush administration uh, used that as a model for the Northwest Hawaiians uh, Marine Reserves, and certainly the Obama administration used that uh, nationally at the national level as well. Um, our economy wide cap on greenhouse gas emissions has inspired others. Uh, no, nothing has, uh, nobody's had the economy wide has reached that point yet, but uh, the state of Oregon is working on some of this, which Max has been up in Salem working on that, so he'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and also the size of California, being the fifth largest economy and having the size of the market that we have, uh, we, learned, we figured out back in the 70s and 80s, really, that if we could get um, if energy efficiency standards enacted here, uh, we could have you know, the most efficient refrigerators in the nation. If, you, they, if we could get that adopted, then the refrigerator makers would, you know, if they're gonna make refrigerators to meet California standards, they might as well make clean refrigerators for the rest of the country. And the, gradually, you know, we, the refrigerator manufacturers actually went to Washington and said, we would like one standard so that we don't have different states make, you know, requiring us to build different things. So um, that's just one example of how, you know, a state, albeit a very large and powerful state like California, can have an outside, uh, an influence outside just one state. Um, this, uh, this is one of my favorite slides, um, and this is kind of how my touchstone for how I hope our, what we do here in California has an impact uh, beyond our borders. Uh, this actually was drawn in 2006 after California adopted the Global Warming Solutions Act, and at the time uh, there was uh, action in Washington, D.C. Uh, to get a federal climate bill. Uh, we do know that, we all know now that in 2010 we uh, failed to pass a federal bill, but um, at the, uh, it was 
It stalled in the Senate, uh, thanks to Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, but it, um, had, it passed the House uh, with the leadership of Californians, Nancy Pelosi and Henry Waxman. So uh, though that continues to be, you know, we have very uh, expert and committed legislators at the federal level uh, that as soon as we get somebody in the White House who is ready to act, we'll be ready to act. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that, but we have lots of climate champions from California. Um, the, and I think that it's not just the federal government that has adopted programs that we pioneered here in California, but other nations have as well. Uh, and other states and provinces. So that's very exciting, I think. And uh, so even though California uh, emits a small percentage of the global warming emissions uh, internationally around the globe, uh, we really have driven a lot of the policy development. So I'm often asked, uh, how is it that California can make progress where things are so bogged down in Washington, D.C. and other states? And uh, it really is, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's not a matter, but you know, why can't other states and the nation do something? It's not a matter of science. We know the science. It's not a matter of policy. We have the policy ideas that we need to reverse course on climate change. And it's not a matter of, it really is a matter of political will, political power, and the courage to act. And it takes a long, it has taken a long time to build that here in California even. Um, I, it, but a lot of it comes from the ground up, I think. Uh, Californians consistently in bipartisan majorities are counting on their state to do something about climate. And they elect people who have platforms that include action on climate. And when uh, the oil companies uh, start trying to influence the legislators in Sacramento, uh, we can always count on reminding folks' constituents up there that you know, if you get to the, tell their constituents that their members in the legislature are wavering, you can be sure that their constituents will make themselves heard loud and clear that they expect them to act. So it's, it really is a bottom-up thing, but it also is you need to get the right people in office to make tough decisions and to stick by them. And I think um, here in California, We've had the California, the electoral group, the California League of Conservation Voters that has been working for decades to identify folks at the local level from city councils or boards of supervisors and I encourage them to run for state or federal office and then also to hold them accountable when they get there. Um, and you, you can tell, you can see the voting records have changed over time in, and it's working in uh, the California State Legislature. You had the majority party there back in the 80s and 90s. They were voting in like the 60% pro-environment range. And for the last 15 years or so, the majority party's been in the high 80s, low 90s percentage um, in voting for the environment. So we've seen a steady increase in that. And that is um, in spite of the fact that you know, oil industry and uh, developers are spending as much or more in Sacramento than they ever did. So it's not, um, it's not just, you know, it's not easy to get this stuff done, but I think, I certainly feel when I'm in Sacramento and working with our team that uh, the people really do have our back there and that the, they are expecting their uh, elected officials to vote to protect the environment. Um, just thinking about um, how many things California has done, and, and I think importantly that we've done it um, 
as early actors. You know, we were kind of first in before their time actions and back in the 70s and 80s. And so if you see that we've had a collective time of 40 years now of having good energy efficiency standards, having um, air quality standards and other uh, policies, NRDC just did a look back uh, in a report that we just released last week. It's Calif called California Stars, if you want to look it up. Uh, and it, uh, we analyzed if the other 49 states had done what California has done for the last 40 years, that uh, we would be emitting as a nation almost 25% less carbon net today than we are. And that's about equivalent to the emissions of Japan. So that's not insignificant at all. Um, and it really does show that uh, state action can, can make a difference. Um, but as we all know, uh, whether from the IPCC report or the US report that came out recently, we're, not, we're still not doing enough fast enough. And um, I think that uh, we saw that last year. Oh, I don't know. Getting nothing. Did you get it? Okay. But it doesn't have the bars. <laughs> huh? Oh well. It's just that we all know this, but it was a good char chart. There you go. No. Keep her going. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, there it's going. <laughs> it's populating. <laughs> there it's going. Um, and so last year, you know, there's nothing to make uh, you feel like there's urgency. The, the wildfires, the droughts, the floods, the mudslides, the king tides, all of that is really uh, driving home the sense of urgency. And under normal, normal political circumstances, these type of uh, disasters really do bring uh, parties together and politicians together. Uh, a couple of examples, when the Exxon Valdez ran aground, in Alaska, Congress passed the Oil Pollution Act that uh, put together, put in place tougher standards. Or when there was a clean water attack, Fisteria outbreak in Chesapeake Bay, they updated the Clean Water Act to get tougher standards in place. Um, it's just kind of an exam uh, just example of how politicized climate has gotten that uh, Congress is not acting despite the fact that it's not just California that's experiencing uh, extreme weather events, but uh, lots of Gulf states and Midwest states are having these issues as well. So uh, under normal circumstances, that, there would be a conversation in Congress about how to protect their constituents, um, but the, we are not living in normal times here. Uh, certainly, you know, time matters. When we passed the, clean, the Global Warming uh, Act in 2006 or the uh, SB 375 about transportation and land use in 2008, we could not have imagined the type of ex uh, extreme weather events that are fueled by climate change that we're already experiencing. So it's certainly, um, it you know, gives us a sense of urgency. Um, I also have just a, a reminder, kind of some of the basics of where our uh, greenhouse gases uh, come from in California. You can see that transportation continues to dominate. And I'll say that it's really proved to be uh, one of the most, the most stubborn area of how are we going to get the emissions out of the transportation sector. Um, and we need to redouble our efforts. Max is going to talk more about that. Um, our dependence on fossil fuels continues. 
Um, and this is just kind of how we use it. Once again, you see that uh, transportation accounts for 44%. Um, now, we are really making good progress in uh, cleaning up our electricity sector, um, but we've got to do more to give people more options to get out of their cars. Um, we have, we're making cars more efficient, we're electrifying them, uh, we're getting cleaner fuel, but until we figure out how to give people more options to get around without a car, I think we're gonna, it's gonna, we're gonna continue to be frustrated in our goals. Um, example of, you know, last year we passed a 100% renewable goal. Uh, that's now been adopted in several other states. Uh, this is kind of just a quick timeline of how we plan to get there. Um, one of the main reasons it, we are getting there is, well now it's going backwards, is the falling cost uh, of that. And it really has become cost competitive. Uh, so it's really, we're making smart, businesses are making smart business decisions to, um, to adopt cleaner standards. And um, one of the, I wanted to mention uh, a group that NRDC is closely allied with, Environmental Entrepreneurs, which uh, was started by a couple of folks in the Bay Area. Nicole Letterer here in Palo Alto is one of the co-founders. And they've done amazing work in really kind of changing the narrative in Sacramento. And now they've been working in states around the country and are getting into a lot of Republican offices in Washington, D.C. as well with the message that um, environmental protection and economic prosperity go hand in hand. Uh, and they really were very instrumental in changing the message in California and like breaking up kind of the big block of businesses don't support environmental uh, protection or environmental regulation. And they've done brilliant uh, fact sheets broken down in every district, legislative district in California of how much the clean energy economy has helped invest in those uh, districts. So it's very useful to legislators to, so that they have those kind of local facts at their fingertips. Um, so overall, California has in fact done what is achievable worldwide if uh, we could just get the political will to do that and as we have decoupled economic growth from carbon pollution. Uh, you don't have to have both. Of course, California's success story wouldn't be a success story if we weren't healthy economically as well. So we don't have to, the good news is we don't have to wait for Washington, D.C. to act, and we aren't waiting for them to act. Um, states and cities uh, across the country um, are pulling together and what it's what in the UN climate parlance is known as uh, subnationals. Anything that's not a, a country is a subnational. Uh, and there's a couple of examples I wanted to talk about uh, what California has championed. First, um, internationally, uh, Governor Brown put together a very broad coalition of cities, states, businesses, provinces, and a few nations around the globe called the Under Two MOU, which pulled together um, all these disparate voices to go to the UN talks in Germany and then in Poland this last year. The two talks, the, the annual climate meetings that um, the U.S. would normally be a leader in, but is now MIA. Uh, and with, with this coalition, California and others demonstrated that uh, we're, st we're still taking action and we're doing more. And all these groups, all these uh, different levels of government have uh, indicated that they're committed to the Paris Agreement commitments and that they're taking action. Uh, another uh, coalition that we helped start is called the We Are Still In Coalition. Um, I, when I, I went to the uh, UN meeting the year after Trump was elected, and 
the other nations were kind of really wondering what is the U.S. going to show up? Is what's going to happen? Uh, is anybody going to be there? And they did have, the U.S. had a pretty skeletal uh, team there, but uh, the U.S. representatives from states and cities and all over had a huge pavilion. We set up our own pavilion and was very busy, and it, and it really kind of changed the whole dynamic. You know, people said, oh, Cal uh, the U.S. is very active and committed. So, you know, it's kind of like if you can't figure out, if you don't have Washington, D.C. to work with, let's figure out how to do it ourselves. Um, and that's, a lot of that has been fueled by the fact that these cities and states are already feeling the, uh, experiencing the effects of climate change, uh, and their residents are asking for action. Again, it's kind of that whole bottom-up dynamic. Um, and then here in the U.S., uh, states throughout the nation, whether it's in the Northeast uh, or uh, in the Midwest, there, since the last, since November's election, we've really had some changes in leadership at the state level that are op opening opportunities for action. Um, in the West, we've got what we call uh, trifectas, several trifectas now that uh, in California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, where you have the governor and the leaders of both uh, houses in the state legislature are pro-environment, pro-climate action. So in these trifecta states, we've been able to uh, take action quite quickly, where it's only May and we've passed several laws in these states that Max will talk about. But again, that's the convergence of the political power and political will to get these things done. Uh, I, I wanted to talk also about what's going on at the state level, or at the city level, excuse me. Um, NRDC has an exciting new program that we have teamed with the Bloomberg Foundation to set up this uh, American Cities Climate Challenge. So we um, asked the 100 most populous cities in the nation to uh, apply for these programs, and we picked 25 of them. You can see that there's three in California, including San Jose, uh, and eight here in the West, and there's a commitment to invest $70 million in these cities uh, embed policy experts in the mayor's offices and really uh, supercharge local uh, climate action. Um, and so many of the, w the winning cities uh, really are focusing on high impact policies. So in cities, buildings and transportation make up over 80% of the carbon emissions. So those are the, they're, they're in that policy areas where they're going to be focusing. Um, and they've already are off to a great start. It's just a two-year program. By 2021, we're expecting great uh, things here. Uh, Bloomberg doesn't do things halfway, I can assure you. Uh, and they are, <laughs> they've already met and are, you know, getting, also, they're not just doing policy, they're, um, training folks on how do you build consensus and at the community level and uh, really creating a movement at the city level for action so that when we do have someone in the White House who's ready to take action, we are ready to go and we'll be ready to go on day one, I can assure you. If, uh, you know, just as an example of how important cities are is if these 25 cities do everything they've promised to do in their you know, proposals, they can uh, almost meet the entire U.S. commitment in the Paris Agreement. So that's just a kind of a sample of the, type, of the scale of what can be done without Washington, D.C. <laughs> it's kind of my theme. Uh, so I just, the, so whether it's at the state or the city level, uh, I think, you know, what California has been able to do is demonstrate that, you know, there's a lot of different policies that put together can make a huge difference. Um, and also working with other states, being very careful 
Uh, and I know, Max, you've had this experience of going, to, whether it's in Salem or Denver or Carson City, is you're very careful not to say, oh, this is how we do it in California. You do not say that. <laughs> That's a surefire way not to get them to listen. But they um, are very interested in the policy details and the political co coalition building that we've made. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Max, and talk a little bit about some of the specifics in the other states. Uh, thank you, Andy. Um, I'm going to stand because uh, I have senior attorney in my title. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? All right. So, um, whereas Annie is responsible for every environmental challenge facing humanity, um, <laughs> my job is much more straightforward. I only have to deal with climate change. Which is an easy problem for us to solve. Um, though I'll take heart in the fact that we actually do know what we need to do to solve it. And it's a tough nut to crack, but we have the right nutcrackers in hand. So uh, I sit on NRDC's Climate and Clean Energy Program, one of our four principal programs, and I'm on the Vehicles and Fuels team within that. And so I get to work on reducing emissions from the transportation sector. And as Annie noted, that's the sector that's really the hardest to squeeze the carbon out of. Um, and we can't just, like with the electric sector, like we've done with market success, order the electric companies to buy renewables. And we can't just tell consumers to buy electric cars and more fuel efficient cars. Instead of regulating a handful of entities, you know, you can't just pull a regulatory lever on 300 million consumers overnight. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't know what we need to do and that we don't have the right tools to do it. It's just a little tougher. And it's where a lot of the action really is. And nationally, a couple of years ago, transportation sector emissions surpass the uh, power sector emissions, power plants. And that is increasingly true across the country. It's been true in California for a long time, where our electric grid was already clean, and thanks to the commitments that California has made over the years, including go all the way to 100%, and we'll have to remind people in Sacramento that you can't actually go above 100%. <laughs> uh, you know, we are getting it uh, cleaner and cleaner. The good news is that the electric grid is basically everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And it's becoming cleaner and cleaner. So we just need to use it to power basically everything that we can. And that includes a lot of the things that we do inside our buildings. And it also includes extending the grid at the periphery into our driveways and our parking garages. And um, as Diane Bailey is doing here at Menlo Park to try to make it so that people can plug in their cars at home and power them with increasingly clean electricity. Now, NRDC works on all three legs of the proverbial transportation emissions stool. So as Annie noted, you, know, you need to reduce the need to drive and give people as much as practical options that, other than a car. And so we have a huge program that works on that, um, our Healthy People Thriving Communities program and the American um, Climate Cities Challenge uh, is part of that program. I'm on the Climate and Clean Energy program. I work on the other two legs of that stool, which are uh, massively improving the efficiency of vehicles and then switching to zero carbon fuels. So um, NRDC, uh, and to Annie's credit, um, has a reputation in Sacramento for actually letting policy wonks and experts like myself or my supervisor, who's an MIT PhD, um, loose in the Capitol building. <laughs> Whereas many other um, organizations just let the lobbyists do that. Nerds can stay at home for your modeling. Um, and um, that has um, led to a lot of us cutting our teeth in Sacramento. And I was there today, actually. Um, and then. Once we've cut our teeth in Sacramento, which is actually in many ways more like Washington, D.C., relative to many of the other states, um, they sort of let us loose in other states. And so I'm going to provide a few tangible examples of uh, this leadership that Andy talked about extensively. So developing policies and programs in California and then exporting them to other states and across the globe. So back in um, 
2015, I was um, lucky to be part of um, advancing what was then, uh, what is still known as Senate Bill 350, or SB 350, which was derivative of Governor Brown's three goals articulated in the State of the State Address, that then um, Senate uh, Pro Tem uh, Kevin De Leon, who recent, most recently gave it to Diana Feinstein a run for her money, um, at, are put into a, a bill that would require that at least 50% of the state's electricity would be come from renewable resources by 2030, double our energy efficiency goals, and then in its first iteration, cut petroleum use in half. Now that last piece didn't have a robust set of policies and programs attached to it in the way that the first two pieces did. It was more of an aspirational target, but cutting petroleum in use in half definitely riled up the oil companies. Um, and they uh, got moderate Democrats to stand up in force and march into the, um, the legislative leadership offices and have that piece of the bill stripped out. And it was got a lot of coverage in the press at the time for a relatively rare um, feat to Governor Brown in many ways. Um, but you know, I think he shrugged it off to a degree and that part was you know, more aspirational. And we shrugged it off too because meanwhile, folks like myself were quietly working on another part of the bill that the oil company lobbyists didn't bother to read um, <laughs> because it was a long bill. Um, <laughs> that basically told the electric industry to go steal the oil industry's market. Uh, and it told it, the state's Public Utilities Commission to direct the big electric utilities, uh, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric, PG&E, and the smaller investor of utilities to make programs and investments to accelerate the electrification of the transportation sector to cut carbon emissions 40% by 2030, 80% by 2050, and meet the state's air quality standards and our equity goals. And as a result of that part of the bill, a billion dollars of investments uh, has been approved and is going in steel into the ground right now to provide charging infrastructure for cars, trucks, buses, airport equipment, cranes, anything that moves. And another billion dollars in proposed investments is pending review before the Public Utilities Commission right now. And we're litigating those cases. And I'm involved in 12 regulatory proceedings in California right now to make that happen and keep building upon that progress. And a billion dollars in authorized investments and another billion dollars in pending investments gets the attention of utility CEOs in other states in the way that an NRDC blog cannot. <laughs> um, so uh, utilities across the union have followed suit in red, blue, and purple states. And we're engaged in uh, between 10 and 20 regulatory proceedings at any given point in states across the union. So I um, serve as attorney and expert witness in those. And to Annie's point, you have to manage uh, the, you know, hey, I'm from California, curly haired and viral, and the answers. Uh, but when, actually, really refreshingly, if you show up in, at the Public Service Commission in Lansing, Michigan, um, the commissioners there are really happy that you made the trip. And they're much more engaged, and they know that we've done a lot of the hard work. They don't want to replicate our missteps. They want to replicate our successes. So I found that it's much easier to get the attention of regulators and legislators in other states than it is here, because California is a big place. So I've enjoyed going to states across the union and engaging in those regulatory processes. Now sometimes, uh, because utility regulators and because uh, utility companies are not exactly risk takers going way out on a limb, we need a legislative kick in the pants to akin to what we had here in California with SB 350, to tell them to do this and to give them the cover to do it big instead of just little piddly pilots. So, um, and to give you a few tangible examples of export of California policies, I'll note that even before our Governor Brown's signature had dried on SB 350 in California, I was already up in Oregon working with our longtime advocates on the ground there and other folks within our team in the context of another bill that would require the utilities to procure 
half of their electricity from renewable resources. And we inserted the provisions working with our partners there that would also direct them to help electrify the transportation sector. Um, and that's moving forward with more significant programs finally starting to come to pass up in Oregon as well. Um, and we took very comparable provisions more recently. We tried it um, three times in Colorado. And to Annie's point about politics making a difference and who's voting making a difference, we had a Republican author all three years uh, as a co-author who was a champion. Who, during the course of our time with him, fought an electric car of his own. Um, and you know, he's not going back. But until all three houses turned blue and got us the trifecta that uh, the two houses plus the governor's office, um, you know, we didn't get it across the finish line. But we just did um, two weeks ago. So that bill, just like the one here, directs the state's utilities there to help make significant investments um, to electrify the transportation sector. And the electric utilities have the scale, scale to be able to do that and be a political counterweight to the oil industry. And we also extended the state's tax incentives. Um, and there were a total, to Andy's point of like, when these places flip and you get that trifecta, things happen fast. 13 climate and clean energy bills have passed in Colorado this session. Uh, I was involved directly on two, but we had other folks working on many others, and then there were others that we were sort of tangentially aware of, and they have to do it. That's cool, too. Like the bill that um, makes it so that uh, if an ice hole parks their uh, gas car in an EV parking spot, they can get a ticket. Um, that happened in Colorado this session, too. But we also worked in New Mexico, where our colleague Noah Long, uh, who's a Santa Fe native, and he was on the board of the League of Conservation Voters, to Annie's point, um, made it such that uh, I could go there with my wife, who was born in Los Alamos, next to Mexico, and during the course of two naps for our then two-year-old son on subsequent days, on the first nap in the afternoon, go meet with the Mexican equivalent of Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi and get buy-in for the bill, and then on the next day during nap time, go meet with legislative council and draft it, uh, and it just passed another bipartisan bill to likewise direct the electric utilities there to help electrify the transportation sector. You know, we can have an outsized impact, whereas often if you undertake the uh, long drive to Sacramento, as I just did today, you can come back with, well, I think that was worth it. Um, <laughs> so you can, I, I think it's, it's really good for us to not just think about our bubble here, but into these other states that collectively can make a difference. Um, and then to leave you with a, a, a very hopeful note, and to, because it's, the reality is that, yeah, California alone, or even California plus Colorado, New Mexico, Oregon, these other states in the West, and even some of our leaders back East, are still, you know, small, globally. If you want a tangible example of that type of aspirational leadership that California is projected on the international stage, represented by the under two MOU, the Governor Brown champion, which encompassed something like a third of the world's population, which is a big deal from an aspirational point of view, but if you want to translate that into real emissions reductions on the ground, um, if you have a ground game in, in other countries, in the same way that we have Noah Long in Santa Fe, NRDC started its China program in 1995 and has an office in Beijing with Chinese nationals who work there day in and day out. And um, one of our um, staff advocates there largely wrote big parts of China's coal cap, basically just caps the amount of coal that China is ever going to use. And right now, uh, regulators in China are working hand in hand with regulators from the California Resources Board to copy and paste California's zero, zero emission vehicle mandate, which is the stick that requires automakers to sell a minimum percent of zero emission vehicles. In, in the U.S., other states have adopted those regulations. Collectively, we represent about a third of the automotive market in the country that requires that I. 2025, 15% of new vehicles sold, these are emission vehicles. That's cool that a third of, you know, you know in California, that's one and a half million vehicles nationally, around 3.3, but 15% of China's automotive market is a much bigger deal. So that's, 
you know, super concrete example of how not just our technologies, but our policies can be stolen, and this time gratefully and willingly by the Chinese, and make a huge difference. So I'll leave you with that hopeful note about how we can have a difference on, or make a difference on the global stage. Wow, that was uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. And our speakers have agreed to stay uh, for some Q&A. And what we'll do is, um, just to give everybody a chance, please uh, uh, keep your questions brief and keep them in the form of a question. I'll come with a uh, microphone if you raise your hand. And uh, yes. On the transportation side, can you get where you're going really without a carbon tax, or is that a, necess a necessity to get there? Well, I'll, I'll start, but let Annie uh, chime in. I, mean, I think we think of economy-wide carbon pricing as the backstop. It's the thing that it guarantees we get the emissions across the board. But we don't think of that as being sufficient alone. And we're not of the mind that you can just put a price on it and that the market will just figure it out. We really do need a measures that go after these technologies and force the market transformation that takes decades to occur. So for the transportation sector, um, that carbon pricing is playing a complementary role, right? Like all of the, um, we've invested on the vehicle and fuel side collectively in excess of $1.6 billion in incentive programs that come from our state's cap and trade program on purchase incentives for electric vehicles, trucks, buses, equity pilots that are scrapping um, old polluting vehicles in the Central Valley and giving low income folks access to cleaner vehicles, a whole host of programs. So I think they're complementary. Um, but yeah, we don't think that just putting a price on it alone is going to get us. And I don't know if we have enough time either. Um, you know, we can get consensus on appliance efficiency or uh, those kind of uh, clean energy policies. In fact, there's a couple of bills we're working on right now in Washington, D.C. that have some legs on them. Uh, but if you get Politically, it's just so divisive, this issue, that we think, you know, we can get all these other policies in place that are going to um, have the effect of reducing the emissions. And then it's a backstop more than a central. Hi. Um, as you know, about 15 countries have announced plans to phase out sales of new gasoline vehicles anytime between 2025 and 2040. And Jay Inslee, who's running for president, is running on a platform of a gasoline car phase out by 2030. In other words, no new cars will be gasoline as of that date. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I know you said you can't force individuals to buy, um, to go switch out their cars. But under this um, mechanism, anyone can keep their gas car as long as they want. It's just that when they go to buy a 2030 model year car, it's not going to be a gasoline car. So I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that as a pretty elegant and I think very equitable uh, solution. Yeah, there's been bills in California. Assemblyman Ting's had a couple of uh, phase out bills. Uh, they've stalled in the California legislature. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of the political feasibility on a national scale. Uh, but with the kind of leadership that Governor Inslee is, you know, showing on this, I wouldn't I'm not going to bet against him at all. I'm hoping that he'll be, be successful, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's inverting the equation to a degree in that California's standards are on more of the affirmative thought that we're going to get to 100% EVs by such and such point. So, you know, whether you want to call it a gasoline phase out or a program to increased EV sales, it's just the flip side of the same fraction. Um, I think California, to a degree, NRDC has chosen to work more on the affirmative positive side because we don't want to play into sort of the NRA's playbook of, you know, first they came for my guns, then they came for my Mustang. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
Two really quick questions. What, the first, uh, I'm a member of NRDC, and I know similar to um, the recent newsletter from uh, Actera, often you can click on something to support a bill uh, that's in Congress or at the state level, and NRDC newsletters also have that same information. So I'm, the first question is whether people here could easily become NRDC members, maybe? I did not pay charity. her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do, we, do, we, do we have a link on the Actera newsletter that maybe people could um, get over to NRDC that way? Yeah, we do. Um, we've been increasing the number of action alerts that we're sending at state and regional level. So I've got one that I send out pretty regularly. I think one came out today on a couple of our oil bills that we're trying to get. So I could, um, I'd be happy to send it to you and you could share it with the, with the membership if you want and they can sign up. Oh, great. Thank There's you. There's a petition out there on the to thank you. So it's, can, I, I, can I just oh, note sorry. that um, it's, it's not just um, your, your voice and your money are appreciated, but it also really helps to advocates like myself to be able to stand up in a, a state that's not my own and say, I'm here on behalf of our 24,000 members in New Mexico. And that gives us access to the courts that would otherwise deny it in a lot of places. So whether it's a small dollar or a big dollar amount, like having people that put their money where their mouth is matters. And that is a challenge for a lot of organizations that depend on members with demographics that are shifting and are increasingly not as good as my grandmother was at mailing in her membership check. Um, so we, it, it does matter not just for our budget, but for our impact through your direct voice and then as your representatives. I just really loved um, listening to you and all the hopeful things that you're providing. It warmed my heart. And um, hi, Janelle. <laughs> I um, also just wanted to mention um, my department at Stanford and City of Palo Alto have been teaching electric vehicle classes since 2015. And we've taught about 600 people. And, and when we did a survey, 40% said they'd gotten a car and wow. that they've con connected to our class. So I'm just wondering how you feel about, oh, and by the way, we're having one two weeks from tonight, if anybody <laughs> wants to, I have flyers. Um, I wondered how you felt about the role of education in helping people make these changes. Uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. I, that coupled with the, um, induction stove. I think that's one of the most, is going to be the toughest. I'm always telling our team that, you know, there's so many women or chefs who have dreamed about getting their big gas stove. And so how are we going to change that uh, whole societal norm? And I really thank you for doing that and showing, demonstrating um, how you don't have to change your lifestyle all that much. But of course, you know, I think we should be honest as well as there are some changes that we're going to need to make. Um, they're, they're not hard changes necessarily, but you need to be deliberate. And most of us uh, learned how to recycle, you know, and these are things that, you know, become very routine and comfortable. But you need to, and having that type of education opportunity where you can actually show people, put them in the car and make sure that, you know, they see that it's not, they're not on a bicycle or whatever, although Max, Max is on a bicycle. Right? So. <laughs> um. Annie's been assailed in front of the governor's office as the woman who's going to pry gas <coughs> stoves out of people's foot <laughs> hands. Um, but I'll know that my mom has spent her uh, 30 years as a professional chef, and um, I've cooked on induction stove tops, and I cook uh, almost all of our family's meals, and they really are pretty awesome. So I think it does, we need some celebrity chefs and such to make them sexy, but education at the grassroots level and at that level is the type of thing we need to do to make this happen. Yeah, well, we have a sign up. You can, you can try one for yourself. We have two questions, you and then you. Uh, can you comment about uh, policy efforts underway to phase out gasoline taxes and replace them with some sort of mileage-based user fee for funding uh, highway work? 
Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, we're facing a funding crisis for the transportation sector across the country. The federal gas tax hasn't been raised in 30 years since it was put in place. It's lost sevenfold its value because of inflation. Um, and then people generally overlook that fact and the inflation fact and focus on fuel economy or electric vehicles is like, oh, they're gonna sink our transportation funding ship. Like, not so much, actually. Inflation, the big one, fuel economy standards and improvements, second biggest, and then electric vehicles are a bit of a rounding error. Um, there are advantages to switching to something like a vehicle miles fee, but there's also some potentially significant environmental disadvantages of doing so because the gas tax is the single biggest price on carbon that we have. So there's some significant research demonstrating that if you were to ditch it, you could have some serious emissions um, challenges. And if you look at places like in Oregon where they've piloted that out, they had to cap the number of like suburban and Hummer drivers who volunteered into the program, because they would save money, whereas the Prius drivers and the EV drivers would get hosed. So um, at least I'm of the opinion that you don't need to throw the gas tax away. Uh, you can just tweak it, index it to inflation and total fuel consumption, and let it just basically decoupling the gas tax and something we did in the electric sector for ener to advance energy efficiency 40 years ago, and it's a modest tweak, and then you could extend it to electric vehicles um, relatively easily. So we that's a solution that has not been put in place anywhere in statute despite our efforts, and it's a problem. Like last week in Illinois, uh, a $987 fee on electric vehicles was proposed annually, um, which is more than like some Class A trucks. So it's a something where it's a, and now 25 states across the union have these anti-EV fees. So we're we're dealing with this. Yeah. And Are it's those a, being supported by the by the U.S. OEMs? No. The automakers don't really want. Uh, them. Sorry, would you uh, just in case people didn't hear your question? Could you just repeat the question? Yeah, I was just trying to understand which OEMs are pushing for that. I mean, Ford and GM are committed to electric. I don't get it. Yeah, it's not the so OEM original equipment manufacturer automaker. Um, it's not the automakers who are doing it. It's um, in some instances uh, like Koch Brothers funded groups on the right, but sometimes. Um, folks on the left who want more money for to fix the roads, to pay for buses, and sort of have the impression, oh, EVs are just driven by rich people, they can pay these fees, not recognizing the fact that unlike vehicle registration fees that decline over time, those are going to stay with the car for the, its life and are pretty regressive for all the low and moderate income folks that were trying to get in to EVs. And it's, not, it's also not really addressing the real sources of the problem. So. We have some other ideas. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first, is there any work or visibility on coming repowers as an inexpensive alternative? Are you coordinating or, co or collaborating with finance and businesses who want to stop fossil fuels to bring the best technologies to market? And um, infrastructure cost cuts could equal the taxes. So if, if you use new technologies, are you looking at anything, or would you consider using lower cost solutions instead of higher taxes and, and educating the governments on that? Uh, I think the answer is yes, yeah. low cost solutions. Like, that's one of the slides I had about um, the declining cost of clean energy, for sure. And, um, you know, we n are not in the business of endorsing any a specific company or something. We try and set uh, clear r rules of the road and standards to uh, incentivize, you know, companies to meet those. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, and on the, um, there was a question in there, I think about repowering, and um, I think for most passenger vehicles, it's probably not going to be a scalable solution, but maybe for some of the cherished vintage collectibles that folks have in their garage that they want to keep driving in cities like the ones that Janelle's highlighting that are um, starting to ban combustion vehicles there. 
But I think it's more promising um, for things like transit buses, and there are some companies based in California that are doing that because um, those buses have often been repowered to go from diesel to diesel powertrains, and it's the shell that is often a large part of the expense. So repowering them to electric in that instance and extending their useful life could make a lot of sense and potentially be cheaper than building the whole thing from scratch. Buses, I think, are next in line for um, yep. some of these the clean requirements. So I have, um, uh, we'll take uh, one more question and before, I'm gonna slip my own question in. <laughs> so um, I, I was really excited to hear that you're really successfully able to export good policy to other states. Um, and I'm wondering if for people, regular people like me uh, who want to uh, do something to support that cause other than supporting NRDC. Um, it, are there actions individuals can take to help in that work or are we limited uh, in our influence to, our, uh, to the state of California? Well, I think you can support climate leaders. You know, Governor Kate Brown from Oregon last year, for example, um, had uh, last year she committed to doing a cap and invest bill uh, if she was reelected, and she had a, a challenger, and she was very nervous about being reelected. And if she hadn't been reelected, uh, you know, I don't think that he would be doing cap and invest this year. So you can inform yourself about folks that are on the ballot and who will make a difference and whether or not they're in office. Uh, all of these states have, you know, the Oregon League of Conservation Voters, the Washington League of Conservation Voters, the New Mexico League of Conservation Voters, so um, it's pretty easy to find out about those. Uh, NRDC, also we've been, we're doing more regional action alerts in Oregon, Washington, Colorado. Um, Honestly, you can find out about it, but you know, if you are not a constituent and you write, I don't know what kind of impact that's going to have as so much. Encourage but your you probably to have write. friends and family in many of these states, and you could encourage them to pay attention. Encourage people to vote. Okay, last <laughs> yeah. question. Last question here. Um, we've heard about um, sort of the most of the big things about uh, most of the big tactics that we, we can use for uh, transportation, like um, uh, fuel economy standards, increase the penetration of electric cars and so on. I have a question about one that didn't really get mentioned, which is fee baits and rebates. And in particular, in the context of California's massive number of Hondas and Toyotas, which live for 35 or 40 years because of the awesome Toyota production <laughs> system, all that happens is those cars go from Palo Alto to San Jose, and then they go to the Central Valley. And poor people will drive them for 35 more years. And they're gonna keep fixing them up. So on a, on a rebate side, is there anything we can do to goose the program for cash for clunkers, which currently only pays 1,000 bucks? Can we do like, for example, a surge, where for two years you pay 3,000 bucks, and you get you know, three million of these cars off the road now? Because I recently saw a talk with Hal Harvey where he was talking about the bathtub problem fine, you can get the number of new electric cars up in terms of unit sales every year, but the balance sheet, the big amount of, of water that's in the tub drains out so slowly that the turnover of the existing population will be very, very sluggish without something to accelerate the exits. Yeah, uh, in fact- That's a good question for Max to <laughs> end on, because he- <laughs> uh, Yeah, so we, we authored legislation in partnership with environmental justice, public health, and um, environmental partners um, with Senator Kevin de Leon in 2014 that amongst other things directed funding towards California's version of the cash for clunkers program, the scrap and replace programs that are operational in the Central Valley and in Los Angeles area now. And their incentives are much higher, up to $9,000. And um, they operate them in a community-based way with at fairgrounds, with people lining up at 5 a.m. with their clunkers to get rid of them. Um, and it's had a, a big impact. Uh, and it's, you know, part of that program was something we highlighted on the steps of the Capitol with a, a car crusher um, and handed the keys to a family from the Central Valley who drove away from the Capitol in a, in a plug-in. So we're working on it, but, you know, it's, 
you're right to highlight that challenge because there's only sort of two ways to work it on either end. You gotta change the composition of cars coming onto the road or take older ones off the road earlier than they would otherwise be retired. Um, but it's not cheap to do and it's not easy to convince people to do that. And for years that program was actually operating in a way that was sort of paying people to scrap cars that were about to die anyways. And Senator Henry Stern authored a bill, or no, he wouldn't, he didn't author his when it back when he was um, Fran Bavley's right. staffer that would sort of corrected that. Um, but it's I, tricky. But I think one of the, uh, things that California really has contributed to the national conversation about is that we have some magnificent leaders, climate leaders um, from the Latino community who have, you know, Senator De Leon likes to talk about how he taught the electric car how to speak Spanish, right? And how um, you really talk about, figure out policies that are going to work for all Californians, not just folks in you know, some zip codes. So I think um, making climate policy and good, clean cars accessible to a broader audience is really key, and California has um, pioneered that as well. True. Well, please uh, join me in thanking these two amazing speakers. Thank you, Thank you so Thank you. much. Uh, and if you enjoyed this lecture, please know that the fall 2019 Actera Lecture Series is coming and uh, watch your Eco Happenings newsletters for, for that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.